Hello and welcome to the final part of chapter three of Costanzo's physiology textbook. In this portion, we're gonna go over the motor systems, going all the way from the affected neurons all the way up to the central nervous system and how we actually stimulate a motor plan. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. If you're in need of the textbook, there is a link within the description. So as an overall thought, posture and movement is really the whole function of our motor system. It's just helping us get around and also make sure our posture is normal. We're able to stand or sit or stay balanced. So that is able to be achieved through either involuntary reflexes through the spinal cord or through voluntary actions through higher brain centers. We are going to start at this involuntary reflex portion that relays through the spinal cord and mainly involves some local reflexes from your muscles. To get into a bit of anatomy first, we have a motor unit which is just one single motor neuron. So one single neuron and all of the muscle that it innervates. So if this one single motor neuron innervates just a very small quantity of muscle, then it's obviously going to control fine motor movements like we have in our eyeball. Now, if the motor unit is one single motor neuron that innervates a large muscle group, let's say our entire quadriceps or your thigh muscle, then clearly that's going to be a less finer control. So not as much control of that movement, but we're able to generate a lot more force. And that's where the size principle comes in. So we're able to generate a large amount of force by first ramping up the smaller muscles first. So the smaller motor units start to get innovated first. They have a lower threshold. They contract, start to generate a little bit of force. And over time, if the stimulus is strong enough, then we're going to recruit our larger muscles to then cause a greater amount of force and then recruit our entire muscle and generate the force we need for a particular action. So we do actually have two different types of motor neurons, those neurons that innervate each muscle. Alpha motor neurons are the ones that innervate our skeletal muscle. So alpha, just for every single skeletal muscle out there, it's getting innervated by these alpha motor neurons. Whereas gamma motor neurons, they actually innervate these intrafusal muscle fibers. So these muscle fibers, which are called muscle spindles, they have a slightly different role. They don't actually have a contractile role. They're more involved with our reflexes trying to maintain our posture during these movements. So gamma motor neurons innervate non-contractile muscles, which are more receptors. And they are these intrafusal fibers. So we can see that as we have this diagram of muscle spindles in figure 3.32 over here, where at the top, we have the extrafusal muscle fiber, which is our skeletal muscle. Just think of our quadriceps. It's the big skeletal muscle that generates force, and it's innervated by the alpha motor neuron. Now, right next to it, running parallel, which does not really have a role with contraction, is our intrafusal muscle fiber, or muscle spindle. And then that's blown up down the bottom here because we actually have two different types. They're both innervated by gamma motor neurons. One's innervated by the static motor neuron, the other one innervated by the dynamic. And the two different types includes the nuclear chain fiber, chain because it's just one after the other, and then nuclear bag fiber. Bag because our receptors are all within a bag here. They're kind of collected into one little region. So these muscle spindles are able to identify when a muscle is moving and how stretched that muscle is. And then that allows our body to identify exactly where our joints are getting positioned. So then we're able to innovate other muscles to make sure we're able to maintain our normal posture and our normal movement. If we don't know where your muscles are, you're gonna just randomly generate movements and be very uncoordinated and it's going to be hard to maintain your posture. So these muscle spindles help to to keep your body aligned and make sure you're able to continue the movement that you've planned. So it's able to do that by running parallel to this extra fusal muscle fiber, the actual skeletal muscle. So it's going to actually lengthen when the muscle lengthens and it's going to shorten when that skeletal muscle also shortens. And then that gets sensed by these group 1A afferent nerve fibers. As you can see, they run right in the middle of the muscle spindles. Group 1A afferents, remember 1A meaning they're the largest and they're the fastest neurons, they're going to quickly send a signal about the velocity of the length of change in that muscle fiber. So if there's a sudden movement in the muscle and it's going to suddenly change, that's going to get sensed instantly 
buddies group one a efferents so then the body knows that that muscle is moving the group two efferent which is sensing just the bottom of the nuclear chain fiber this only identifies the length of the muscle fiber so it's more of a static position just purely wanting to know how long the skeletal muscle is so what happens to this information why do we need to know when the muscle is moving fast and what position it is it allows us to do some muscle reflexes. So then the signal re-innovates alpha motor neurons to then contract and keep that muscle nice and stable. So a good example of this is our stretch reflex or our knee jerk reflex, which is where you use that little hammer against your patellar ligament. It stretches those fibers. So then these fibers feel a stretch. They get sensed by that group 1A afferents, which then reflex arcs through the spinal cord, innovates the alpha motor neuron, causes contraction of the quadriceps muscle. So that stretch is sensed and then a reciprocal contraction occurs to help reduce that stretch and contract the muscle back down again. So it provides some stability. Now that is an example of a one synapse reflex, a stretch reflex or the knee jerk reflex. We do also have another one, which is a two synapse or the Golgi tendon reflex. They give this example of the clasp knife reflex. It is a little bit confusing. I think the easiest way to think of Golgi tendon reflex, which is actually using the Golgi tendon bodies within tendons themselves, its role is to actually sense contraction of the muscle itself and shortening of the muscle. That then goes up into the spinal cord via the 1B afferents, and then it's able to have innovation to multiple synapses here. One which inhibits that muscle which was just contracting to then result in lengthening of the muscle. And then it also innovates the antagonistic muscles to then contract. So it inhibits the contraction of the muscle and then it causes contraction of the antagonistic muscles. So for example, if your bicep suddenly shortens, it's going to tell that bicep to relax and then it's going to tell your tricep muscles, the antagonistic muscle, to contract. So then you're able to maintain normal hand posture. So in this way, you're able to relax muscle that's getting contracted. Whereas with the stretch reflex, that is able to contract muscles that are getting stretched. So these reflexes are just keeping everything in check. So then if there's a sudden movement in one direction, then we're able to correct for that movement. If you're falling over, you're able to then sense which muscles are getting contracted or stretched and send a reflex to then correct that position. The flexor withdrawal reflex is an example of a polymodal synapse. So you can see there's multiple synapses here. And this is the classic example of touching a hot stove, stimulating our nociceptors, which then gets sent to the spinal cord to then cause contraction of the flexor muscles of the arm that's touching the stove and then inhibit the extensor muscles to then withdraw your hand. You're contracting your bicep, relaxing your triceps. So then you're actually pulling your hand away from the stove then at the same time you're causing a contraction of your extensor muscles and relaxing your flexor muscles on the opposite arm so you extend your opposite arm to maintain your balance everything that's working here all these spinal reflexes are just helping to maintain our balance and correct any over movements or respond instantly to stimuli in the environment this opposite reflex here with a contralateral extension this is called the crossed extension reflex and then and also with the flexor withdrawal reflex, we have this other phenomena called after discharge, which is just that even after you've removed your arm away from the painful stimuli, there is still a constant action potential, just making sure you keep away from that stimuli. So that is some of those local reflexes right at the muscle level involving the spinal cord to try to maintain your posture. But now we are going to actually go up more into your central nervous system, including your brain stem, cerebellum, and cerebrum. So let's start at the brain stem, which helps to control our posture and movements as well. We have these descending motor pathways. Now this is a little confusing because it does almost just assume you know normal anatomy and jump straight into some terms here. So we'll try to keep it as simple as possible for you. So we have two descending motor pathways, meaning that there's two types of pathways that go from the central nervous system down your spinal cord to then innervate your muscles. We've got the pyramidal tracks and the extrapyramidal tracks. Basically, extrapyramidal just means all the tracks that do not include the pyramidal tracks. So if you just memorize the pyramidal ones, then you can, by exclusion, know what your extrapyramidal ones are. So your pyramidal tracks include your corticospinal and corticobulbar tracks, which actually pass through 
through your medullary pyramids. So since they pass through the pyramids, which is just an anatomical position within your brainstem, since it goes through those pyramids, it's called the pyramidal tracts. Now the corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts are the only two tracts that pass through this pyramidal tract. Whenever you see these tract names, so corticospinal, corticobulbar, and then these other extra pyramidal ones, so rubrospinal, pontine, reticulospinal, the way to know where these tracts are going from and going to is just looking at the start and the end of the name. So corticospinal, it's going from the cortex to the spinal cord. And that same pattern follows through for the corticobulbar tracts and all these other ones too. So for instance, the rubrospinal tract, which this one you just have to know that rubro stands for the red nucleus. So R and R means that it's going from the rubro region or the red nucleus region to the spinal cord. Pontine reticulospinal tract means from the nuclei of the pons, so pontine, pons, all the way to the spinal cord as well, etc, etc. So that's just a little cheat way to try and understand where these tracks are going to and from. Now when it comes to knowing what their role is, it almost just comes down to rote learning, where the rubrospinal tracks go from the red nucleus to the spinal cord, mainly does activation of flexor muscles and inhibition of your extensor muscles. That is the role of that one tract, the pontine reticulospinal tract has a different function where it causes activation of both flexor and extensor muscles with a predominant effect on our extensors and so on and so on. So it's better just to memorize each of these ones if you need to know every individual tract. It's probably getting a bit in depth but I'll leave that up to you to know whether or not you need to memorize those tracts or not. Now this is important because this can relay into the clinical environment as well where you can identify a specific lesion based on the sign called decerebrate rigidity. Basically what this is saying is that if this is our spinal cord and then this is our brain stem up here, we have this region right here where we have our pontine reticular formation and lateral vestibular nuclei. And these two guys have a very powerful extensor stimuli. Whereas all the nuclei more up here, more involve inhibition of the extensors and more activation of our flexors as well. So if we have a lesion right in this region here, then we stop all that inhibition to our extensor stimuli and all we have is activation of our extensor stimuli from these two nuclei. So you end up with just a very dramatic extensor posture where obviously all your extensor muscles, so everything that makes your arms extend, your legs extend, are now being activated. So that's just a way to localize a lesion. So that's the brain stem. Getting to the cerebellum, the cerebellum helps us to have a very coordinated movement or controls the rate, range, force and direction of movements. So it just kind of smooths everything out. And the best way to really understand that is that a lesion in the cerebellum results in something called ataxia. Ataxia is basically what it's like when you see someone who is intoxicated, where every movement is uncoordinated, the legs aren't quite moving where they should, you're kind of swaying from side to side. That's a very basic way to think about ataxia. So lesions in your cerebellum almost causes this very haphazard movement like that. So there's three main divisions of our cerebellum. And once again, it has this kind of naming to it where the vestibulo cerebellum means that it's receiving input from the vestibular system. Spino cerebellum, it's receiving input input from the spinal cord, and then pontocerebellum, so it's receiving input from the pontine nuclei or the higher centers of the brain. So a vestibular cerebellum obviously involves balance and eye movement. Spinocerebellum helps with those spinal reflexes that we talked about earlier. And then the pontocerebellum helps with controlling pre-planned, coordinated, voluntary movements, trying to smooth out those movements that we're planning to do. So for example, trying to shoot a basketball shot, it's going to have input in that region. So it also goes into the actual anatomy of the cerebellum using this figure 3.36 here, which we we can really go through all of the information we need to know for the cerebellum just using this figure. And it is a lot of information that it pumps in to some very short paragraphs. So it can be hard to really memorize when you're first going through it, but we'll try to keep this as simple as possible. Where we have three layers to the cerebellum. The bottom is the base of the cerebellum. Let's just think about that. The top up here is the outer surface. So if you're going to touch it from the outside, you're touching the surface. So the bottom layer is the granular layer because it contains mainly the cell bodies 
of our various cells here. And we also have our glomerulus here, and the glomerulus is just a collection of our mossy fibers. And the glomerulus is really just a meeting point for various cells here, and we'll get into those too. We have another layer going up called the Purkinje cell layer because it contains our Purkinje cells. And then our outermost layer is the molecular layer. And the molecular layer contains some other cells, like these basket cells, these outer stellate cells, but also mainly contains a lot of the dendrites and axons from our various cells. And you can see that we have these parallel fibers as well. So we've got kind of this vertical transmission of information and parallel transmission of information. The parallel transmission of information goes through our molecular layer. So those are our various layers here. We have two inputs, one coming from the climbing fiber, which you'll see only innovates onto a Purkinje cell, and it does its action potentials through complex spikes. And then we have another input our only other input into the cerebellum through the mossy fiber and it sends its signals through simple spikes. So two inputs, the climbing fiber and the mossy fiber. The climbing fiber only to the Purkinje, mossy comes into the glomerulus and interacts with various other cells here. We have only one output which is the Purkinje cell. The Purkinje cell is the only output from the cerebellum and it is actually only ever inhibitory. So it's helping to prevent the overreaction to a movement. So smoothing movements. And Purkinje cells are inhibitory because they only have GABA neurotransmitters. Remember, you should just think of GABA as an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And that's what the Purkinje cell does. So it's inhibitory. And that's the output from the cerebellum. We then have processing within the cerebellum via the parallel fibers, which interact with our various cells. And then also our climbing fiber, which is almost just priming our Purkinje cell and modulating the responses from the mossy fiber. So the mossy fibers are doing the majority of the input here to then spread it around the cerebellar tracts, trying to then create the signal that we want. It then wants to send out an output through the Purkinje cell. And then our climbing fiber is just modulating that output through the Purkinje cell. So that is really just the basics of the cerebellum, trying to keep it as simple as possible. Now, next up, going further up in the central nervous system, we have the basal ganglia, which is kind of deep within the telencephalon. It includes this caudate nucleus, putamen, globus pallidus, amygdala, all these various nuclei are kind of deep within the telencephalon. It helps to really regulate the movements coming from the cortex. You'll see that in this figure 3.37 here, where the signals from the cortex, which are trying to get down to the thalamus to then get sent out through the body, has to go through the basal nuclei first. So the basal nuclei are almost just modulating and helping to plan and execute smooth movements by interrupting that signal from leaving the thalamus initially. And it does that through these two pathways. The direct pathway, which goes in this direction, as you can see outlined down the bottom here, and then the indirect pathway, which goes down to the striatum, then out through the globus pallidus, down, down, and out through the thalamus in that way. Now it's a little confusing how this is outlined because of all these positives, negatives. Basically positives means it activates that nucleus, negatives means it inhibits that nucleus. But as you can see with the direct pathway, if it gets activated, it's going to inhibit these nuclei here, which are inhibitory nuclei on the thalamus. So by inhibiting this, you're preventing the inhibition of the thalamus. So it's actually a excitatory pathway because you have inhibited the inhibitory nucleus. So then the thalamus is able to send out those signals. So the direct pathway is excitatory, whereas the indirect pathway is inhibitory because it's inhibiting a nucleus, which is supposed to inhibit the activation of the inhibitory pathway. So by inhibiting this first inhibitory nucleus, you are actually allowing the subthalamic nuclei to then activate the inhibitory effects of the globus pallidus and the substantia nigra. So you end up inhibiting the thalamus. Basically, it's a very complex method of being able to regulate the movement going from the cortex to the thalamus, and diseases of the basal ganglia causes some pretty renowned diseases such as Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease. Parkinson's disease is just a loss of our substantia nigra, whereas Huntington's disease is a loss of our neurons, both the striatal and cortical cholinergic neurons and the inhibitory GABA neurons as well. 
So by losing those neurons, you end up losing the ability to actually cause movements from the cortex. Whereas Parkinson's disease, we just end up with a loss of the indirect pathway and the direct pathway. So we, we just get a reduction in the basal ganglia's ability to modulate our movements. So Parkinson's disease usually results in this intention tremor, slowness of movement, shuffling gait. It's just not being well managed in the basal ganglia. And then lastly, we move up to the motor cortex. So this is right up in the cortex. So this is voluntary movement. This is where we actually create the thought that we want to move. So the motivation of ideas to produce voluntary movement, it's first organized or created in our associated areas in the cerebral cortex, and then it's transmitted to our supplementary motor cortex and pre-motor cortices to develop a motor plan. Basically saying you are going to contract your biceps, relax your triceps, and then move your scapula in a certain way or what have you, you are going to want to move all these particular muscles to then be able to throw this ball, let's say. It's planning the movements for your arm to throw a ball. This plan is then transmitted to the upper motor neurons of the primary motor cortex and then sent down to the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord to then execute the plan. So in summary, the pre-motor cortex and supplementary motor cortex generates the plan sends it to the primary motor cortex for execution of that plan. And that primary motor cortex is topographically organized, creating this motor homunculus. So then we're able to actually know exactly where we're sending those signals. So that is the motor system. There's a very brief section here on the higher functions of our nervous system, learning memory, cerebral spinal fluid that we'll just quickly touch on. So at the moment, the only way we're able to record the electrical activity within our brain is this pretty crude method of an electroencephalogram, which is just putting electrodes on our cerebral cortex and trying to identify kind of mass electrical movements. We can't identify individual action potentials, but it's just this kind of mass movements. So we have all these various EEGs in this figure 3.38 here. So an awake person, when our eyes are closed, we have these predominant alpha waves, kind of short choppy waves here, and then beta waves when our eyes are open. And then that we've had EEG studies all throughout sleep as well. And we have four stages. Stage one, when we go through alpha waves and predominantly. Stage two, we end up with these high frequency bursts of waves called sleep spindles. And then stage three, which isn't shown here, where it's described as more of a low frequency delta wave and occasional sleep spindles. And then we've got stage four, which is just these large delta waves. And then down the bottom, REM sleep. REM sleep happens approximately every 90 minutes. You have less REM sleep as you get older. And REM sleep is rapid eye movement sleep. This is when you are in a very deep sleep, when you're predominantly dreaming, and you're very hard to wake up. But paradoxically, your EEG during your REM sleep is actually very similar to an awake person with their eyes closed. Now getting into learning and memory, learning, the definition here is the neural mechanism by which a person changes their behavior as a result of their experiences. Whereas memory is just the process of storing what is learned. So there's these two types of learning, non-associative and associative. Non-associative is really just through habituation or sensitization, where a repeated stimulus results in a gradual reduction in the case of habituation or increase in the case of sensitization in the response. So the example they give is if you first moved to New York City from a rural area, you're probably gonna keep waking up to the noises outside, but over time, those noises or those stimuli are no longer gonna wake you up because you're getting habituated to it. Sensitization is the opposite, where a stimulus you get more and more weary of. Whereas associative learning, there is this constant relationship between the timing and the timing of the stimuli. So this is more the classic thing that you think about learning where you just do repetition and then you're able to more easily execute the plan. And that's more describing operant conditioning. So the response to a stimulus is reinforced positively or negatively, causing the probability of a response to change. And that's more of your classic learning, you know, repetition to get the response that you want. Now, synaptic plasticity is more of a mechanism that just helps to underline learning. And the way to think about that is if you don't use it, you lose it. More scientifically, you know, we have potentiation, 
which is just how repeated activation of that neuronal pathway leads to increased responsiveness of the postsynaptic neuron. So the more you use the neuron, the more responsive it is. The less you use it, the less responsive it is. Once again, repetition helping you to either memorize concepts, being able to do a particular mode of movement, whether that's shooting a basketball, throwing a ball, you know, repetition, helping to reinforce those neuronal pathways. Long-term potentiation uses the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate that gets received by the NMDA receptor, which is thought to increase this potentiation or increase the sensitivity of this postsynaptic neuron by increasing the calcium within the cell. So then that somehow increases the responsiveness of the synapse. So a very quick portion on learning and memory there. And then lastly, we have our cerebral spinal fluid, which is just the fluid that surrounds our brain and then also is contained within these things called the ventricles that are within the brain itself. And it helps to just nourish the brain and keep it safe within its cranial vault. And the cerebral spinal fluid is just constantly getting produced and reabsorbed at a constant rate. So it's getting produced by the choroid plexus, which is just epithelial cells that line these ventricles, so the lateral third and fourth ventricles. And and it flows out of the ventricles, goes into the subarachnoid spaces, goes around the spinal cord, around the brain, eventually goes back into the venous system via one-way bulk flow to go back to the systemic circulation. We can sample the cerebral spinal fluid using a lumbar puncture, which is just inserting a needle between the vertebrae right in your lower back to take a sample of your CSF fluid to tell us whether there's any inflammatory cells, you know, any signs of meningitis or something along those lines. Or you can also administer substances, usually local anesthetic, to then block those nerves. So then you block all the nerves in your lower back. You know, that's what they do during the lumbar punctures to then numb basically the lower half of your body for an anesthesia, for example. So we have these two barriers to our brain. We have the choroid plexus, which is the barrier between the arterial blood and our central spinal fluid. And then we have the blood-brain barrier, which is the barrier between our arteries and then the interstitial fluid around the brain cells themselves. The interstitial fluid and the cerebral spinal fluid, they're very similar in composition, and then they just empty into the cerebral venous blood. Now, the important part about the choroid plexus and the blood-brain barrier is that they are very tight in terms of being a barrier, they will only really allow lipid soluble substances to get through them. The blood brain barrier, predominantly that's due to this three layer system and using these glial end feet, which are these kind of feet processes with tight junctions to keep everything from leaking out of the arterial system. And that helps to keep you know bacteria or drugs these harmful substances out of our brain and keep our brain nice and safe. Obviously, some lipid-soluble substances can get through our blood-brain barrier, and those are the ones that affect our central nervous system. If you have inflammation or cancer or something along those lines that's breaking this blood-brain barrier, making it more permeable, then you're going to have increased effects from substances that normally don't cross the blood-brain barrier are now able to enter the brain. Maybe you're going to get an infection in the brain or something along those lines. Otherwise, the cerebrospinal fluid should have a composition that's kind of outlined in table 3.6 here. So similar sodium, chloride, bicarb, osmolarity as blood, less potassium, calcium, glucose, amino acids, etc and then more magnesium and creatinine. It helps to create this normal environment for our brain, which is obviously the most important organ of the body. So that's the end of that chapter. There is a summary section here. I've tried to highlight the main points. Feel free to kind of pause it at this level if you'd like to go through them. We've also got the first two questions here, and then if we move over to this next page, we got the other questions here if you want to question yourself and test yourself for this chapter. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to support the channel, get audio versions of all these chapters, check out the Patreon link within the description. Otherwise, feel free to drop a comment and we'll see you in the next video.